This is Teacher's Corner from Stenhouse Publishers. I'm Nate Butler. Last fall, we published the widely acclaimed Building Fact Fluency, a toolkit for addition and subtraction by Graham Fletcher. Building Fact Fluency is a comprehensive, research-based toolkit designed to help students learn their math facts by developing conceptual understanding and procedural fluency at the same time. To create, design, write, and produce it was a tremendous undertaking, to say the least. And he's doing it again. The Building Fact Fluency Toolkit for Multiplication and Division is in production now and will be available in late 2021. Today's Teacher's Corner features Graham and his editor, colleague, and good friend Tracy Zager sharing a sneak peek at the features in the new kit and discussing the challenge of and purpose behind creating intriguing and accessible contexts for students. Hello everyone, it's January 11th, Monday morning, and Graham Fletcher and I, I'm Tracy Zager, and I'm talking to my my buddy Graham Fletcher. We've been hard at work on the Building Fact Fluency Multiplication Division Toolkit. Um, while everyone else was having family fun over break, we were texting each other about lemons and paints, and um, we're having a ball, and we thought we would take a few minutes today to talk to you about what we've been up to. So good morning, Graham. Good morning, Tracy. Yeah, nice to uh, nice to kind of come out of the weeds here. We've been uh, we've been tackling this now for for some time. Super excited to start field testing it here in the next uh, in the next week or so. Um, super excited to just kind of dive in, talk about what we've been doing, what uh, what we've learned from the addition and subtraction kit, and how we're uh, continuing to build that fact fluency not only in a K two classroom but now extending it three five and then also into the middle grades for sure. So yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's always awesome to talk to you. The truth is, I will tell you all, the truth is we were on another call before we even started this because we talk so many times a day about this project. We're both living it and we just love it. Um, so Graham, for somebody who's new to the whole idea of the Building Fact Fluency toolkits, how would you describe them? What are they? And what's the, let's start with what are they, both of them? So uh, I guess in, in order to the, the toolkit, one of the things that really got me to the toolkit was uh, I loved number talks. Uh, I, I, I love number talks, the number string. Uh, I've been using them as, as a classroom teacher. I've been using them as a coach and supporting just that work at a district level for, for numerous years. But one of the things where I would become super frustrated is, uh, is I realized that students would know their strategies. So whether we're talking about just simple uh, addition and subtraction, like that make a 10 strategy, when we were doing number talks, kids would know that make a 10 strategy. But then the second that I would turn and take that say nine plus seven that they're able to use with a number talk, whenever we would contextualize that, and what that means is by putting it into like a word problem that they'd have to solve, students would no longer use that make a 10 strategy and they revert right back to counting strategies, which isn't a problem, but I, I knew that students knew the strategy. They knew how to think flexibly and, and, and accurately. And they had that efficient strategy of making 10, but they would never apply it in context. So at, at, at the ground level, that is, is what building fact fluency, the toolkit, is, is all about. It's about building uh, fact fluency through problem solving. Uh, Cassia, uh, one of our, our colleagues that we've kind of knocked heads with a couple times here throughout this project, is she says that that fact fluency should be an outcome of rich problem solving. And, and a lot of the times what I realized is before we started tackling this problem, this, this toolkit, is uh, myself, throw myself right under the bus here, is I would put fact fluency uh, as a granular idea where I take it, put it on a shelf, and then I would just kind of tap into it whenever we needed it. Uh, but it would never be that fact fluency was interwoven through all the rich mathematical things that we were doing. And at the, at the heart of it, context, building fact fluency through a context is, where, uh, is what kind of separates this kit from a lot of things that are, are kind of out there. You're making me think about how fact fluency has historically been a prerequisite to interesting math, like a gatekeeper. It's an equity issue uh, because so many kids are not allowed access to interesting and worthy math problems until they know their facts. They're over at the round table doing worksheets on facts instead of doing the rich problem solving they could be doing. Um, so rather than viewing fact fluency as some kind of prerequisite to doing all the work that follows 
um, we're getting at fact fluency through that interesting problem solving and, and rich tasks. Uh, absolutely. Right. So I start thinking about, especially when we start looking at, uh, at third grade with multiplication, it's like, let's get our facts out of the way and then we'll start problem solving where the problem solving and the facts, they need to be interconnected. And, and you're right. When you talk about, uh, it, it being a gatekeeper, absolutely. We have so many students who feel as if they're not mathematically competent because they don't know their facts. Uh, and, and when we've talked about this numerous, numerous times is it gets pretty crazy how, how in third third grade students are expected to know all of their facts in like one year like let's kind of just cram everything on students and how many students leave third grade not knowing their facts and now they've developed this negative disposition about themselves and how they relate to math and and that's kind of what we're trying to to compete compete with here is is how do we allow students uh, the accessibility to facts and not see that just because you don't know your facts based off of speed we're now focusing on that interconnectedness and relationships of number which is is what fact fluency is really all about for sure yeah totally i i have feelings about that placement in third grade <laughs> i have feelings about that and you know one thing when we were writing the addition subtraction kit we were in the standards it, the facts aren't nailed down till second grade but you've got kindergarten and first grade and second grade to get there and there are kind of partial benchmarks in kindergarten first and second grade but in the addition sub, or i'm sorry in the multiplication division progression they're kind of front loaded in the standards and um, and we're, we're not in the business of writing standards, but we are in schools regularly or we would be in COVID. We're still working with teachers and, and coaches all the time. And we're just not seeing kids get those facts all the way done in third grade. That just doesn't seem to be reality. Um, so we do you want to talk a little bit about how we've built a multi-year progression into the kit just based on, on it's certainly standards aligned, but based on the reality that most kids are not going to get them all in just one year. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a, a kind of a, a great starting point. Um, one of the things uh, that we leaned on a, a lot, like there's years and years of of research, but one of the one of the the big resources that we leaned on was uh, Gina Kling and Jenny Bay Williams' book uh, Fact Fluency, and and they talked about uh, two sets of facts: uh, foundational facts and then derived facts. So uh, when you and I were probably in, in students growing up, and and we were in third grade, it was uh, know your facts, but you'd be zeros one, two, three, four, and it would be in that sequence, in that chronological order. And, and what, what research has shown uh, is that there's, there's ways that we can uh, group facts together but that helps build more sense. So for instance, if we know that students in, in a K-2 class, in a kindergarten through second grade class are coming to us with an understanding of tens, fives, twos, like skip counting by tens, skip counting by fives, skip counting by twos, then that seems like the natural place where we'd wanna start in, in third grade. And then from understanding those foundational facts, zeros, ones, twos, fives, tens, and, and also uh, squares was a really beautiful uh, thing that I was introduced during this, this journey that we're on right now is, is just like students know their doubles facts in, in addition and subtraction, students also kind of naturally gravitate towards squares. So like four times four or six times six, uh, those now, those square facts also become a foundational fact. And then from there, we can can develop those derived facts, which would be your threes, your sixes, your fours. You know, you can get to your fours uh, from doubling your twos. So then those other facts come after we've really established those foundational facts. But then when we start looking at multi-year, those first foundational facts, what we've done is we're building those off of an understanding that happens in a K-2 classroom. But then also, as we begin looking at extending for third grade and, and fourth grade, is we don't want to look at just fact fluency as, as isolated related single digit facts, students should also be beginning to really kind of leverage those properties. So for instance, if we start multiplying three times 13, we would maybe decompose that 13 into a 10 and a three. So even as much as we're talking about fact fluency in this kit, we've been really intentional about layering in scaffolding and extensions wherever needed so that we're showing that fact fluency isn't an isolated skill that we just put in a box and you know it and stuff it on a shelf. We show how this is really uh, this, this understanding of number and number relationship, how it really sets students up for success, not only with fact fluency, but 
but also with multi digit and that's where we begin to layer in fact fluency with third grade but then it also supports fourth grade fifth grade and and as as you can see with as we're writing the the facilitators guide right now it really dives into that multiplicative and proportional reasoning where we really fall short in middle school so that's kind of how it's layered in throughout the different grade levels um, you're making me think about some of the the folks that we've leaned on, the you know, and, and tons of work that's gone on for decades um, in how children's thinking about the multiplication and division in particular develops. And um, two of my favorite books that are just powerhouses together are um, from the CGI crew, from Carpenter and Frankie yes. and Linda Levy, is thinking mathematically, connecting. I think it's called connecting arithmetic and algebra. And then from um, Virginia Bastable and Deborah Shifter and Susan Joe Russell, their book, which I think is called Connecting Algebra to Arithmetic, I might have those reversed. They, their titles are interrelated. But through that, that work and others, we keep looking at how the properties get uncovered right from the beginning with the single digit facts. It's not that the kids learn their facts and then later on in algebra, they should learn their properties. It's that a kid who thinks of sevens as fives and twos is has just discovered the distributed property. And uncovering it in the single digit facts um, is so important because then they extend that work into the, the multi-digit facts and it ends up being the foundation of um, the, all the algorithms, certainly partial products and things like that, but also um, all the proportional reasoning and, and uh, rates and ratios and all sorts of things that come later, finding an equivalent fraction that it's all connected. So, um, so we're, we've been talking a lot about how those single digit work. Um, it, it's just one long progression up through much later mathematics um, of that connection between arithmetic and algebra. It's really exciting to, to have that algebra work right from the beginning, but that might sound scary to folks. Like if they don't remember these words, does that, you know what I mean? Like if, if people think, wait, distributed property, isn't that what you do in middle school? What would you, why would you be talking about that in third grade? Right. Absolutely. I think I, I would say for me personally, this has been one of the biggest, <clears throat> this has been one of the biggest shifts between the addition and subtraction kit to the multiplication and division kit um, is, is I, I like the term that you've used just when we've been talking back and forth is you talk about how we're actually baking the properties right into the context. Uh, and, and I'll throw myself right under the bus here as a, as a third grade teacher of eight years, whenever I would start tackling multiplication and fact fluency, like, uh, I would never really try to leverage the properties, uh, and I, I would kind of leave those as a standalone skill, and if we could get to the properties, we'll get to the properties, but don't really worry about the fancy names. And, and so what, I've, what we've really tried to do here is, is really show that those properties are the gatekeepers to building a rich, robust understanding of fact fluency. And when that happens, students can now leverage this for years to come. But it, it might sound scary. Like if you start hearing about properties as a third and fourth grade teacher like that, that does get a little scary. It, it was scary for me, which is probably one of the reasons why I avoided it in the early years of, of teaching. But the more that I've understood the properties, those are kind of like our superpowers. Uh, when we understand those, we can apply them just as you'd shared before across all different number, not just with fact fluency, but we start talking about fractions. Absolutely. So yeah, these properties and, and, and the resources that you mentioned as well, like everything that they're talking about in these resources that we've leaned on and countless teachers and educators have leaned on talks about the importance of, of properties. But too often, I think properties only get talked about in, in fifth grade and definitely in middle school. But let's start sooner. But I think the multiplication and division kit is definitely that's something that we're really trying to highlight as much as possible. So we have these like schematic things that uh, where, where Graham and I look across the kit and think about where where do we see the associated property emerge? Where do we see the commutative? We got to get commutative up early because when a, when a child figures out the commutative property, the next thing is they realize they only have to learn half the facts because they can just flip them around, right? Winner. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but figuring that out is not obvious because... Um, it, it depends on the problem type. And so Graham has been working on creating contexts um, for students to discover those properties through the tasks. Um, so maybe we should talk a little bit about that. Like what would be a series of tasks, we call it a lesson string in the kit, 
that um, where we can start introducing some of these properties in in accessible everyday uh, ways using everyday objects. Like your house is full of stuff right now. What kinds of stuff did you get to record these photos and videos? Yeah, uh, there's it, it, it's great. So on this journey, uh, both my girls. Uh, those of you who are familiar with me and my work, my, my girls, I have two daughters, my wife and I, we have two daughters, one who's now currently in fifth and one in eighth. And we kind of tear the house up and uh, we've been taking pictures all over the place. But one of the things that we've tried to do is is use these contexts. So a context is uh, a lot of the times when we talk about properties, those contexts um, are void of properties. It's just naked numbers. So one of the things, Tracy, where you just mentioned a lesson string. So there's a lot of really good resources out there. They're like student facing resources, but they lack coherence. And, and what I mean by that is, is you might have a number string over here and then you might have a game over here and then you have word problems over here and you have all these great resources, but there's nothing that really connects all of them together. They're kind of like on individual islands. So what, when you're talking about a lesson string, what a lesson string is, is it's a series of individual student facing activities. But what happens is, is we'll use one context. So, uh, that kind of ties all of those components together. So a funny story is uh, about two, three weeks ago, uh, I'm walking out of the Sam's. Uh, I live here in Georgia. You might have a Costco where you are. And I'm walking out of Sam's with uh, 119 lemons. Like I look like a nutter just walking out. Um, so what we're doing then is we're using this context of lemons and we're using the context of lemons for the factor of seven. And, and what I end up doing is I end up taking those 119 lemons and putting them into bags of seven, seven lemons per bag. So that's kind of the context that we're talking about. So here we'll just talk about lemons. And, and so one of the nice things, so here's how a lesson string will work out. To start off, there's a three-act task. Uh, where, where This is kind of different. We're using a three-act than the addition and subtraction kit for those of you who are familiar with that. One of the things uh, that we realized is that we want to kind of like jolt students thinking right at the beginning of, of, of when we're building understanding. We want to kind of leave a mathematical residue. So uh, what we'll do is at the beginning of each lesson string, there's a three-act task. Uh, if those of you are familiar with Dan Meyer and his work, big shout out to Dan for creating three-act tasks. Um, that we have a lemon context with a three act task. And that kind of launches this idea of, hey, we're gonna start playing around with lemons as our context and putting them into bags of seven lemons. And then uh, we kind of build from there. So then we have pictures of the lemons, which instead of going with a number string, it's now like a uh, number talk image string. Uh, and, and just a series of images that are now connected that pull out the math and the properties that we were kind of talking about uh, right there. So you'd have uh, the three act task, then you would have an image talk. And then what we gradually do is we start to strip away that context of lemons and we begin to replace it with a, with a tool. So it might be with a, uh, it might be colored counters and we gradually strip away the context and we, decontextualize that lemon piece of it. So we'd have uh, a three act task, an image talk, uh, a tool talk, and then we would get right down to naked numbers. And those are kind of the components that are the same in the lesson string for both addition and subtraction and, multipli uh, and multiplication and division. But there's also some extra things that we've included in the lesson talks for multiplication and division. Uh, I'm a huge fan of open middle. Uh, Robert Kaplinsky, uh, Nanette Johnson, They've gone ahead and created a beautiful crowdsourced website. They're probably one of my favorite activities to get that intentional repetitive practice that students need uh, with fact fluency. So we've uh, we've designed uh, open middle problems for uh, each one of these factors. So now you're going to have a lot of opportunity to practice these facts with open middle type problems. Uh, we've also included in these lesson strings for each factor, uh, true false statements. Tracy, I know you're kind of a, a big fan of true false statements. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the, the true false statements that we've included? Yeah, I love them. So if you if you think about this context, this is a grouping context. So some some of the contexts involve things that come in groups, and some of the contexts involve things that come in arrays, and then some of the contexts will involve area measurement and comparison. But we have lots and lots of groups and arrays because those are the most 
powerful models for uh, learning about multiplication. They're the, the reason multiplication um, happens, right? So, so this context, we have things that come in groups. And so this is a really nice place for us in the true false to um, push at some of those properties in a grouping context. So for example, we mentioned the commutative property before. We could put up on the board, we could put uh, three times seven equals seven times three. And kids could be thinking about that lemon context. So they've got um, three bags, each with seven lemons in them. Is that the same as seven bags, each with three lemons in them? And the thing is, it's not exactly the same from like a, a grouping point of view. If you put those two pictures up side by side and you said, are these the same or different? Well, they have the same total, but it's a really different story if you're making lemonade, right? So. Um, in the true false, we could put those side by side and say, when we're working with the numbers, two, three times seven equals seven times three, um, is that true or false? And can kids figure out if that's true or false without calculating each side? Can they reason through why that might be true or false? Um, so with, with each true or false, there will be some kind of number sentence where sometimes it's true and sometimes it's false, and we're pushing at properties. That's just a, a commutative example in that case. And I think that's, I know that's one of your, uh, your, your favorite, because what it does is it gets kids to generalize. And, and I think that's kind of uh, a big piece when we start talking about properties, like understand, well, does this always work? Does, does A times B always, is that always going to be the same as B times A? And, and getting kids to not only look at with those individual uh, numbers, but we want them to generalize those patterns as much as possible. So um, yeah, the, the, the true false is, is definitely something that I'm glad that we're adding in here because it really gets students to kind of step back and say, is this true? Is this always the case? Is this not the case? And, and we want them asking those, internalizing those numbers and those relationships as, as much as possible. Um, and another thing that we've included along with the true false is, uh, is same different. And so what, here, what we'll do is Tracy kind of gave an example uh, of the, the seven bags with three lemons in each bag, and then three lemons, uh, sorry, three bags with seven lemons, but showing two images side by side and just asking students what's the same, what's different. And when students are doing that comparison analysis of the two images, well, what they're doing is they're probably going to use informal language for the properties and, and that's a beautiful place because now students are bringing their understanding to the table and then we can begin to formalize their informal language and, and get them to generalize and see those properties. Yeah, properties are, are, are everywhere. And I, I'm super excited that uh, students like eight and nine and 10 year old boys and girls are, are going to have much more access to the properties, which are, are seldom ever really explored, especially in a third and fourth grade class. So that's kind of it. Oh, and the last thing with, uh, with lesson strings is there's also a game as well. So um, games, I think we all like games. Uh, one of the big things with the games that we've included is uh, Tracy, you and I have talked at length about this. We are not big fans of roll and record games. Like just roll two dice and multiply it, cover up that number. Uh, one of the things that we've intentionally done is is designed brand new games that are all strategy based games. So it's like you roll the dice and you have to do this, or you could do this. So you now have choice, and in that choice, you're now probably multiplying and doing way more practice than you would have if you just rolled and and record. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that I'm thinking that we might be missing here off the lesson stream? But that's kind of it. We've got the, 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 go ahead. The card talks. This is a new oh. thing as well. Are the, the teacher size decks of cards. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, um, in the addition and subtraction, uh, toolkit, one in the addition and subtraction toolkit, one of the things that, that we loved about that was the opportunity to, to put five frames, 10 frames and double 10 frames in students' hands, a uh, decks of cards to where they can play with that. And we were, we initially wanted to try and carry that. Uh, I I've in the past, I've created what uh, I call multiplication subitizing cards. And, and we were trying to figure out a way that we could fold those into the kit and get decks. And, and what we, realized is that would push more of speed on students. And that's not something what we're kind of after. What we want students to do is be super thoughtful when they're looking at uh, at subitizing. And, and if you're not familiar with what subitizing is, subitizing is the ability to recognize a, a quantity in a set without counting it. Well, we've used that same understanding with addition and subtraction. Now we've applied it to, to multiplication and division. But with these so, cards, so like, give an example of what a, what a subitizing image would look like for some fact, like three times seven. What does subitizing look like there? 
so what that would look like is uh, three times seven. So if we were seeing that, we'd say three groups of seven. So you'd see three circles on a card and you'd see seven dots inside each of those three circles. And and now when kids are doing that and they might look at that three times seven, they might say, oh, I know that two sevens is 14 and I need one more group of seven, which right there, that's the distributive property for getting at three times seven, two times seven plus one times seven. So by not just putting those cards in students' hands, but by allowing a teacher to have one big display card that they can show to the class, we now allow students thinking time to breathe. Like we're not, it's not about show the card, tell the answer. It's about show the card. How did you find out how many dots are on those cards? So uh, what we really like, I really like the fact that we're now kind of slowing down and, and telling those students that normally like to just blast out the answer. Whoa, we know that you have the answer, but we don't want to hear from you yet. And we actually provide those students, some of our brightest students in the classroom who maybe just need a little bit of think time, we now invite them to take their time, turn and talk with their partner. What do you see? How are you seeing this? How are you putting it together? And we now, that's where those properties, uh, the conversations about properties will come out. So yeah, the card talks, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So in, in the kit, there will be a, a big deck for grouping cards. And, and just to be clear, like kids probably aren't going to subitize as many as seven dots. But the idea there that I think Graham is talking about is like, look, look at the picture and um, be able to see those groups. So that I think of those cards as the grouping cards where we're showing there might be three circles with seven dots in them. And somewhere else in the deck is seven circles with three dots in those, right? So kids can see the difference when you're grouping. And then the second deck of cards are array cards where it's it's blank arrays um, for all the facts. And those are especially nice for the commutative property because you don't need two different cards to show three times seven and seven times three. You just hold up your card and then you rotate it 90 degrees and it's the same thing, right? And so this is a, a really nice device for helping kids start to make the idea about um, how, it, how multiplication commutes and then they can transfer that thinking to grouping um, they won't do that by accident. We're, we built that all into the kit. But um, so so the card talks, teachers might, um, like some of the ones that Graham's building, you might see two cards side by side. It might be a grouping card and an array card or two grouping cards, or it might be four grouping cards. And um, and you say, you know, what? find all the ones that make 20 or find all the ones that make 24. Um, we talked a lot about how to use these cards in a small group. It's a really nice tool for a small group where, cause they're, they're big enough for all the kids to see. Um, so it's a really nice assessment tool. Also, Graham, you want to talk about that a little bit? You saw it right away as something teachers could use to assess facts. Absolutely. Just sitting down with students. So a lot of the times what, like I think about assessment and I think that's a, a, a bone of contention for, for, for both of us. Like we think about time tests uh, and how many times uh, students would again, build that negative math disposition because of time tests. So one of the things that we're trying to be really intentional about is taking away that speed element and really trying to get students to uncover those properties. So by just showing two cards, uh, two cards to students and just listening to them reflect, I can be jotting down annotative notes to say, oh, they're, they're familiar with these ones. Or one of the, the nicest things is you could give the kids a whole deck of cards uh, and just have them go through it and say, pull out the ones that you don't know, like you're not, maybe you're a little bit shaky on and you had to maybe, like you don't know them right away. Uh, one of the things that, that we've, we've kind of like really liked about this journey is kids will tell you what they don't know. Like give the kids, give the kids the cards and say, which ones do you uh, have a hard time with? They'll tell you which ones they don't know. And a lot of the time we don't provide students an opportunity to be driving that learning bus that they're on. Like a lot of times we tell them how to drive the bus, give, uh, giving them the cards or giving them an image and saying, what's the same? What's different? Which ones are hard? Which ones do you like just know just like that? And, and a lot of times kids will kind of do the assessing and the grading for you uh, uh, simultaneously, which is nice. Yeah, that's awesome. The assessment is baked all the way through the toolkit. Um, see, I just said baked again. Maybe yeah. I got to stop overusing. That. <laughs> but we're we're constantly talking about assessment as um, sitting beside kids and listening to them as they work. That's the the root of the word. Um, so rather than the traditional ways that facts have been assessed, which has been really uh, problematic for so many reasons, like it doesn't give you valid information and it's not really a teaching tool and it's super stressful to kids to do those time tests. Um, 
we we have thoughtfully threaded a formative assessment all the way through so that you'll have a really good handle on, on where your kids are with their understanding of the properties and if they have those foundational facts and then if they're extending them to the derived facts and if they're extending all of that into multi-digit um, because there's so many chances to to listen to kids while they're playing games, while they're um, solving problems, you're going to get to use your five practices strategies while they're engaged in the three act task or the the practice problems are all really rich. Um, and, and one thing that is harder about this kit, Graham and I have talked about a lot, is um, we don't like contrived stuff. So addition, subtraction context are a little bit easier because the problems can make sense. But you, like Graham likes to say, things become a gong show, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so like, what's an example where you thought of a, con you, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but like, if you thought of a context and then you're like, wait a minute, I can't make a story out of that. That sounds ridiculous. Who would go into Sam's and buy 119 lemons? That's not going to be a story that makes sense to kids. Uh, absolutely. So I think, I think that's a great, that's a great example. So the lemons, so like when we're taking the, making the three act task and when we're, uh, lemons themselves, like if I was just to get a bunch of lemons and then just put them on a table or put them on a floor in a classroom and take a picture, that just seems so contrived. Like why on earth is this nut job, um, have 119 lemons on a school floor. So in order to make it seem more relate, in order to make it more relatable for students and more accessible for students is I went over to my neighbor's house. He has a, he has a white pickup truck and I, I build the whole context in the back of my neighbor's pickup truck. And in doing so, kids can now say, oh, they're in a lemon farm. Uh, those, those students who are out in California, they're probably familiar with, with lemons and, and the types of fruit that they get out there, but there's a lemon farm. So now we're bringing it to life. He's a lemon farmer. Okay, so now he's got to take him. He's got to put him in the bag before he goes. So trying to bring them, uh, make them as as real as possible. Uh, I think a lot of the times like kids don't, uh, can't relate to what's happening in their class. And that's one of the things that we've really tried to do is is make it so kids can look at it and they can they have access to it because it's relatable uh, to them. And so one of the things that we've tried to do with in choosing the context is try to make them uh, to where they're, they're as gender neutral as, as possible. So all students can relate to them, but also as grade neutral as possible. Like we're not going to put uh, Comic Sans font and, and, and Chevron borders on every <laughs> single thing. Right. Because we want we, you know, right. Like, you know, and we've talked about that, but, you know, uh, like there's kids in middle school. There's kids in yep. middle school that need access to this. So it's almost like we don't want to like gear it's geared for towards third grade. But unfortunately, we have so many students in, in, in middle school, in high school who haven't been provided the opportunities to play and explore. So when building these contexts, when kids look at it, we don't want kids to say, oh, that's baby math. We want them to look at it and we want them to be genuinely intrigued uh, and curious. Uh, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Big shout out to, to Annie Fetter and, and Max Ray there. But uh, but yeah, so trying to make it as authentic as possible for for students, no matter gender or no matter age. Uh, I think that's something, you know, we've really been super intentional about throughout this whole process with both addition, subtraction and now with multiplication and division. A hundred percent. And then the other thing we really care about is accessibility for everybody. So um, part of why Graham was the perfect person to do these kits is that. Um, he has such a, a beautiful foundation in multimedia math tasks. Those of you who go to his website and do the three act math tasks um, know how good he is at this. And, and that has ex like, he's just brilliant at this part. Uh, you know what he talks about? I wondered wh whose white pickup chart that was when I was looking at the photos. He always finds um, amazing surroundings for the photographs that hint at a story. There's an element of storytelling in all the work here that you don't need to be able to read English to access. So most of the, all of the contexts start with um, either images or a short video, and there's no reading to be done. Um, and the, the images in the video grab you right away. Sometimes they're really funny. Um, the other day he texted me the first act of the Bobbers, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's Graham, Graham going fishing and he's walking down the dock and he's whistling and I'm, I'm cracking up over here because it's just funny. There's an element of humor in some of them. So like when, when he went to visit his in-laws, he took the stuff for the, the Bobber's context so he could take great pictures on the dock. Right. So, um, he's been, or like the paints tasks. Um, it's like, uh, there it's an array of little paint pots of all these different colors. It's like a beautiful symmetric array, 
but next to it is a, a some water with brushes in it and a canvas and the edge of a painting and and so students can kind of see it like it's, I just love the way you do that Graham like often it's on the edge of the photo there's just a little glimpse that tells you like oh this is a real context a real story a part of something that I can actually imagine not one of these like pseudo context math workbook problems um, and so then kids right away can start to make sense of it. And we were looking for contexts that are accessible to kids with a wide variety of um, cultural backgrounds and, and lived experiences so that they can mathematize the things that they see in their everyday lives. That's part of what this kid is about. Right. And and I, I'm glad that you brought up the bobbers because when I when I first sent the picture of the bag of bobbers and, and, and you're like, Ugh, I don't like at first it, we were kind of you, it sounded like you might have been like, I don't know if a lot of kids are going to be able to relate to that. Like, if you just go show a bobber to some students who are probably living in some of our bigger cities, like they don't have access to fishing, uh, so that can be really scary to just pull out a bunch of bobbers. So instead, by using that video of me walking down a pier with a fishing pole, whistling, and then dropping it, and then now the water brings the bobbers. So now the bobbers now have purpose. And and by painting that picture, and a lot of the times, I think the word you just use there mathematize like we we try and put things in a book and and kids can never internalize what's actually happening in print so how is it that we can present information and tasks and activities to students where all students have access to it because you know a lot of the times when students look at uh, at a word problem they just shut down and say oh i can't do that but every single student can notice or wonder something from from an image. So, yeah, trying to make it, I think that accessibility is definitely at the forefront of, 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 of every decision we've really made throughout the kit, for sure. Yeah, it's no afterthought. It, 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 inviting students in and um, making this accessible to all kids is something that, like, that's the first step for each of the contexts, right? Like, we're thinking about we need things that naturally come in groups. And we need things that naturally come in arrays and we need to be able to have comparison problems, but they've got to be context that kids can relate to. And if they don't have the vocabulary for it, the vocabulary and the understanding of the meaning of the story will come out naturally in informal language in that conversation about what, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Right. Trying to make it as, as language rich as possible. And I think a lot of times if kids can't talk the language, they're never going to be able to write about the language. So whenever possible, we need to provide students that opportunity to talk ab ab about things. Uh, one of the differences that I've seen with uh, with both kits and w when before I started working on this project, whenever I'd create a three act task, it wasn't so much about storytelling. It was more about just kind of designing a task. But I really think what's happened now is working with the addition and subtraction and the multiplication division, I'm now becoming a mathematical storyteller. So the mm -hmm. importance of having that white pickup truck, the importance of walking down the pier, all of these smaller things that can be really overlooked from us as teachers are now a, a, a truly important piece to bring and invite the mathematics into the classroom. So trying to to become a better storyteller is something that that this whole project has really allowed me to 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 work on is is interweaving the context through the entire lesson string but it's now a story because they're contextualizing decontextualizing all through this context but it's always about the story of the lemons or the bobbers so yeah it's definitely been an area that I've grown in terms of my my task development and as a as a task writer which is something I love doing That's awesome and it's become a family affair like the first one you did was the peaches, right? You went peach picking with your kids and and shot the three act right there on the peach farm. Yeah, the, my, the, the girls happy. Yeah, the girls think they're movie stars, which which is great, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been it's been awesome. Uh, I'm super thankful to 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 my wife and 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 my daughters for for jumping in and joining me on this journey. It's kind of a a selfish journey, but it's been great because they've made it a, a family selfish journey. And so, um, yeah, it's been great the the whole the whole process. Uh, super excited um, to 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 get this out in teachers' hands uh, as soon as possible for sure. So that people might be curious about timing on that. Um, we are working super hard. Just <laughs> both of us are working as hard as we can on this. This kit is harder, right, than the addition subtraction for many reasons. I don't even know if I could nail down why it's harder. Do you do you have a handle on that? Like, why is this one harder? 
because I think it comes down. So for me, it's about, and we kind of we kind of floated it around there today. Is is we start talking about not making it forced, uh, yeah. like like there's so many things that we put in front of students that are forced. So like we have to find natural context for students and, and we kind of miss the boat. So like I start thinking about coin collecting and putting coins inside a coin album. Well, that's a natural context to where you see a raise uh, thinking about cartons of eggs. Like uh, I start thinking about putting like little co- uh, matchbox cars on, on shelves, on a display case. We have to, we've, we've gone a little bit slower, but it's because I think, we want to really find those contexts that are authentic for students. Um, well, and I needed to find the, the right Hot Wheels because, I, like, I'm so happy. <laughs> I ha- Graham, I haven't even sent them to you, but we have our first cover drafts. We'll get them to you, I think, this week. And the there's a Hot Wheel that's – it's an orange – hurts with flames on the side and i've already told everyone at stenhouse that's how i want to go out i want you to (laughs) i want you to take me on a car like that right so we've we've needed to find um and develop really great context and also there's the complexity of like when you're working on your twos you're also working on like when are you working on your twos and when are you working on your sixes if you're doing two times six are you working on your twos are you working on your sixes and which strategies might Um, kids bring into play, there's a lot more overlap. There's a lot more flexibility in strategies in multiplication division because kids might break the numbers up by addition. They might break it into chunks that way, or they might break it up by multiplication, um, or they might use doubling and and go from there. And so it, it's a, uh, it became like, how do we organize this? So Graham and I spent a lot of time creating the frameworks and the structures and the sequencing around the factors and then he's been creating tasks like you can't believe they're awesome um so where we are now is is you're about two-thirds done right with creating the tasks yeah they're they're all done uh starting to to get them and basically we want to throw all all of the games in front of students as well so we want to kind of break everything see what works see what doesn't work um what's nice is we've had such amazing feedback from the addition and subtraction kit uh with just students who normally wouldn't have an opportunity to kind of advocate for their own learning in class that are speaking up and and whether it's it's remote or in person um having all of these being digital. So we're, we're testing it out in a, in a couple different districts. And, and as we do that, what's nice is, is teachers will then be able to provide feedback and, and students will be able to provide feedback. That number doesn't work on the game. Well, is that intentional that we don't have that number there? So um, right. yeah, and then we should get that back in, in about two months and then we just start rolling everything into, into the press and hopefully get it out sometime in the fall. That's kind of the, the time frame uh, for the multiplication and division kit. We're going to work as hard as we can. If we can get it into teachers' hands before the school starts this year, that is our goal. So um, everyone at Stenhouse is united behind that goal, and we're just going to have to uh, do the best we can. It's just there are so many. I can't even describe how many files, literally thousands of files, goes into creating this because we're also building a huge companion website where all these pieces are housed so that teachers can both um, project images for kids to talk about in a really easy way. Um, there's also a whole bunch of professional learning videos, which Graham will record this spring. Once the, the resources are created, he'll be recording professional learning videos where he takes you into classrooms and he teaches these routines himself and then reflects on what went well, what did we notice? What, you know, what might I do next with that kid? I loved the videos of the addition subtraction kit it, and it ends up being really like an online course. It was hours and hours worth of um, gram on video. And so we'll do that in the spring and get that on the website as well. So we'll be working all winter, spring, summer to get it to you as fast as we can. Um, and so far it's like beautiful. The things that I've seen, uh, the design team on this is just amazing. So uh, we're, we're gunning. We swear we're working as hard as we can. Yeah. The, the, what's awesome is where like you and I kind of take like really, really messy ideas and then we can throw them to the team. Uh, the whole Stenhouse team has been phenomenal. Like they take ideas and they only make them so much better. Uh, and, and so when you're looking at those images, when you're looking at images, um, yeah, there's a lot of work and intentionality that went behind those. So yeah, super pumped. Absolutely. Everyone who's working on this project just loves working on it because it's creative and it's different and it's fun and it's going to make a huge difference in kids' lives. Um, when, when I think about the role that fact fluency, what has been done in the name of fact fluency, 
uh, for kids over many years, it's it's often been one of the least favorite parts of math class. And I think in when teachers are using the building fact fluency toolkits, it can become one of the most favorite parts of math class. And that alone just makes me so happy that we can we can make that kind of difference for people because there's no resource like this that exists. There's nothing, if you know, like, I, I don't want to be doing time tests. Well, what do I do instead? The answer to that question has not been obvious. It, it number talks alone or their number talks are wonderful, but they're not going to get you all the way to fact fluency. So um, what Graham has been building is a resource to answer that question. Well, well, how do we teach fact fluency if we care about kids understanding? How do we teach fact fluency if we care about ki how kids feel in math class and their confidence um, and their belief in their ability to solve problems because they've solved lots of problems already? Like these, th this is now a resource that aligns with what we know about how we could be teaching back uh, fact fluency. And I'm just so excited to put it on into the world and see what people are doing with it. So thanks, Graham, for all the work because um, it's awesome. That that's that's it, right? I, I'm a firm believer. All of us are smarter than than one of us. So, uh, you know, we've been we've been working hard to kind of continue to support and 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 build and build that capacity with with teachers, so that they can then in turn go and support students for for years to come. And it's not just fact fluency in third grade; it's fact fluency for success for for life, really. The Building Fact Fluency Toolkit for Multiplication and Division will be available in late 2021. You can stay in the loop on it by signing up at Stenhouse. I'll leave a link for you. In the meantime, check out the Addition and Subtraction Toolkit at Stenhouse. There's also the Building Fact Fluency community on Facebook, where you can connect with more educators who are deepening students' mathematical understanding through meaningful instruction. Follow Graham on Twitter at gfletchy and at his website, gfletchy.com. And follow Tracy on Twitter at Tracy Zager and her site, tjzager.com. I'll leave links for all of these in the description field of this episode. And that wraps up another episode of Teacher's Corner. Check out our website at stenhouse.com where you can find podcast archives, book previews, study guides, and more. If you haven't done so already, we'd appreciate it if you can take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or whatever podcast player you use. It means a lot. If you've done so already, thank you. Please consider sharing this with a friend or colleague who you feel could get something from it. And as always, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Send your thoughts to us at marketing at Until next time, stay safe and healthy.